Okay, so on uh, Saturday 26th of February in Hobart, there was a public event called Gender Identity in Law. Um, the full video from the public event is available on the YouTube channel of the Co Coalition for Biological Reality. The sound quality is great, um, but the image resolution is quite low, uh, and in particular you can't really see some of the detail on the slides. So this is the same talk, but just re-recorded, um, hopefully with a slightly better uh, image resolution. Okay, so gender identity propaganda. My starting point for thinking about gender identity propaganda was reading two books, um, Kaiser Eckes Ekman's book Being and Being Bought uh, and Gail Dines's Pornland. So both do a great job of explaining the way that language has been used manipulatively to shape the way that people understand and feel about social practices that are and have been harmful to women. These are new applications of an old idea. Um, Mary Daly was writing in Beyond God the Father in 1973 about patriarchal language and the way it perpetuated sex caste hierarchy and arguing that we needed to invent a new lexicon in order to achieve feminist aims. So while Ekman and Dines were concerned with the language used to talk about pornography and prostitution, I'm interested here in the language used to do gender identity activism. And in particular, I want to talk to you about the way that some of the language used in gender identity activism has functioned as anti-feminist propaganda, painting women who are reasonably concerned about a range of real conflicts of interest as instead being exclusionary, hateful, bigoted, anti-science, and worse. Nothing could be further from the truth, and I think if we're all more aware of what the language is doing, we'll be in a better position to challenge it and to ultimately refute it. So let's start with a general account of propaganda. Uh, Cheryl Ross, in her 2002 paper, Understanding Propaganda, noted that propaganda is associated often with lies, appeals to emotion, and psychological manipulation. She thought that other theorists of propaganda before that time had been too focused on how propaganda bypasses reason by appealing to the emotions. So for example, here's the Institute for Propaganda Analysis um, from a 1938 pamphlet which she quotes. They write, our emotion is the stuff with which the propagandist works. Without it, they are helpless. With it, harnessing it to their purposes, they can make us glow with pride or burn with hatred. They can make us zealots on behalf of the program they espouse. What we mean is that the intelligent citizen does not want propagandists to utilize his emotions, even to the attainment of good ends, without knowing what is going on. So on the Institute's view, the propagandist is a kind of puppet master pulling at people's strings through the manipulation of their emotions. And this is wrong precisely because people have a right not to be manipulated, to instead be told the truth so that they can make a rational decision about what causes they want to support. Okay, but Ross thought there was more to what is bad about propaganda than just lies and emotional manipulation. So first she argued that this view got things wrong by suggesting that the propagandists used emotion instead of reason, as though these two things are entirely separate. But sometimes particular emotions are reasonable. So in her account, the focus is instead on how the propagandist elicits inappropriate emotional responses. So the propagandist might lie that some state of affairs happened and people might have an emotional reaction that would have been appropriate had that thing actually happened. The problem then is not the emotions, it's the lie. Second, one can be manipulative with reason alone. So Ross quotes Bertrand Russell as writing that someone clever, and I quote, could frame a sufficiently clever argument in favor of any position. So a clever argument made up of entirely false claims might wrongly persuade someone. There's no emotion here, but there still seems to be propaganda. 
and Ross thinks it's located in the false claims because the argument can convince someone of something that they would never have accepted had they known that some of the claims involved in it were untrue. And third, and finally, the propagandist is surely not always a liar. So the first reason for this is that the propagandist themselves might believe the false claim. So they might spread falsehoods, yet not with any intention to deceive or manipulate others. As she puts it, propagandists are often true believers. And the second is that lying can be counterproductive to their cause. If the lies are discovered, this can put the propagandist's credibility into question. So what's a better, more expansive account of propaganda that doesn't have these problems? On Ross's account, what's of central importance is that there is some defect um, in the claims that are made by the propagandist. So they might make false claims, use bad arguments, deploy flawed concepts, or rely on unfair or unreasonable moral rules. So in sum, uh, on Ross's view, oh, okay, I thought I had that. Uh, on Ross's view, propaganda is an epistemically, which means to do with knowledge or belief, uh, an epistemically defective message used with the intention to persuade a socially significant group of people on behalf of a political institution, organization, or cause. And one example uh, of propaganda that she gives in the paper comes from a 1990 US Senate campaign in which an African-American candidate was running against the incumbent, a white candidate. The white candidate ran an ad showing a pair of white male hands, these are the hands from the actual ad, crumpling up a rejection letter with the voiceover, you needed that job and you were the best qualified, but they had to give it to a minority because of a racial quota. Is that really fair? The African-American candidate was on the record as opposing racial quotas. The ad falsely claimed that he supported them and that the white candidate, in contrast, opposed them. The white candidate was re-elected and the ad was believed to be crucial to his success. Okay, so now we're in a position to look at where specifically anti-feminist propaganda shows up in gender identity activism. Let's start with a couple of dramatic examples that I think illustrate Ross's point about it not being emotions per se, but inappropriate emotional responses that are relevant to propaganda. So first examples, razor blades hidden under stickers. So as Joe Bartosz reported for Lesbian and Gay News last year, the Northern Irish uh, LGBT charity The Rainbow Project tweeted out this message. We have been made aware of transphobic stickers being put up around Belfast. Please take a pic uh, and report this directly to ourselves. Try to remove them safely, but use a tool to do so, as we have been made aware of razor blades being placed behind them. The Lord Mayor of Belfast retweeted this, and as Bartosz puts it, outrage flared on social media. There has been no evidence provided of such razor blades in fact existing, and a spokeswoman from a gender critical organisation contacted the police to ask whether there had been any reports of razor blades under stickers, which there had not. If gender critical feminists had been going around putting razor blades under stickers, of course it would be appropriate to have a strong emotional reaction to that, causing people to get their fingers sliced open merely for trying to remove political messaging is repugnant. So this idea that there are razor blades under gender critical stickers is false information disseminated by gender identity activists in order to elicit what would be an appropriate emotional response to correct information. That emotional response, outrage against gender critical feminists, helps to bring supporters to the gender identity activists side and to strengthen commitment from people who are already allied with that side. Second dramatic example, comparisons to genocide. 
So here's a little bit from an article by a philosopher, Mark Lance, writing for Inside Higher Ed in 2019. So it starts in 1702, the New England Puritan Cotton Mather, I'm going to skip down a little bit, asserted that uh, the heathen savages that Europeans had met here were probably put here by the devil, likely lacked souls, were more akin to beasts than humans, and absolutely must be at least converted, and if not, removed, i.e. killed. Skip a little further ahead again. At the dawn of the 18th century, as a mass influx of Europeans are launching one of the largest campaigns of ethnic cleansing and genocide in human history, these remarks are violence. They are an endorsement of genocide and played a very real role in facilitating it. Next paragraph. Recently, a small but highly visible group of scholars has taken to arguing against the growing acceptance of the gender self-identifications of trans people, insisting that trans women are really men, trans men really women, trans lesbians really heterosexual men, and so forth and often explicitly presenting these arguments as support for legal efforts to restrict trans folks' access to public spaces. Lance doesn't come right out and say that gender-critical views are genocidal. He slightly backs off that claim by saying, and I quote, I do not suggest that the current situation around turf philosophers is as grim as the genocide of Native Americans. Obviously, that's down here. Um, obviously, there are differences of quantity and some of content between what happened to Native Americans in the 1700s and what's occurring in academe today. Okay, thanks, Mark. That's very generous of you. <laughs> the difference of quantity and content, of course, being that Mather was literally advocating for the killing of indigenous people if they couldn't be converted to Puritanism while gender-critical feminists are advocating for the maintenance of sex-segregated spaces on the grounds that sex and gender identity are not the same thing. Again, this is a mobilizing of emotion here, outrage, anger, and disgust at racism, imperialism, and violence. And these emotions are appropriate to genocide but they're entirely inappropriate to gender-critical feminism. So the analogy itself is propagandistic. This move also takes a slightly different form in the accusation that in questioning gender identity, gender-critical feminists are denying a person's existence, which tends to slide into wanting slash wishing for there not to exist, which is sort of like wanting a trans genocide. So this tweet was just the top result um, a couple of days ago when I entered genocide plus trans into the search bar on Twitter. And what it's talking about is a state government move uh, in Texas to prevent the surgical transitioning of children. So this slide from a precautionary approach to identity claims to an accusation of genocide is underpinned by an incredibly implausible philosophical claim. It's something like, my specific gender identity is so important to my sense of self that were I not to have it, then I would not be who I am. I, this self, would cease to exist and some other self would exist instead. So if you cause me not to have this gender identity, then you cause me not to exist. Of course, the embodied person with most of the properties they had before is still standing right in front of you and no violence has been done. If you think about replacing some other aspect of identity instead of gender identity in this claim, like being a Christian or a mother or a child prodigy violinist, it sounds absurd. Of course, you, this person, could have become an atheist instead of a Christian, or decided not to have children instead of becoming a mother, or given up the violin early on in favor of taking up a team sport, 
or something else. So we can have an interesting philosophical discussion about selfhood and identity, but just disagreeing with some claim within that debate doesn't put you anywhere near genocide. Okay, you might agree with me uh, that these examples are propaganda, but have the objection that, well, this kind of highly manipulative disinformation, it's only put out by a few bad eggs, uh, and they're not central, it's, those examples are not central to the ideology of gender identity activism. There are bad eggs on both sides, you might think, they kind of cancel each other out. So let me move to an example that is closer to the heart of gender identity activist campaigning, which is the example of inclusion. So there are loads of examples I could have given here, because inclusion is possibly the key word of those who are pushing to have gender identity replace sex in law and policy. But because Senator Chandler is our keynote speaker, and because there's a protest outside targeting her bill, and because this article from Wednesday's Tasmanian Times uh, talks about it, I've chosen it as illustrative. So the headline refers to Senator Chandler's trans exclusion bill. Variants of the word inclusion appear five times in the text of the relatively short article, and once in the image of an open letter that's attached at the bottom of the article. This week, Tasmanian women will unite in support of transgender inclusion, the article claims. We, the undersigned, believe our community is stronger when it is inclusive, equal, and values the contributions of all its members, the open letter declares. This idea of inclusion has been used especially in the domain of sport. It invokes the idea of popular kids in the playground, leaving the weird kid out of their games, and then the protective parents and teachers urging the popular kids to be kind, to do the right thing, to make that weird kid feel included. Nothing very much is at stake. But as John Pike points out in this paper, in sport, inclusion is not the only and not even the most important value. There are also the values of safety and of fairness. Safety is particularly important in combat sports like rugby and football, and a lot is at stake. Injury to women players, places in elite sports for women players for which there is a pipeline from amateur sports, and fair competition for women players at all levels. Pike notes that people... Um, Making policy tend to try to balance these values, but he argues in the paper that this is a bad approach. Uh, he says, authorities have basic duties that cannot be permissibly traded off. And he says that instead of balancing, we should put these values in priority order. Safety first, fair competition next, and inclusion last. And if we do that, Activist cries that keeping males out of women's sport is not inclusive become far from compelling. There's a bit of emotional bludgeoning going on with inclusion rhetoric, but I think the more interesting move is that it's just highly misleading when it comes to the facts of the disagreement. So in Ross's terms from earlier, we have an epistemically defective message being used to persuade people to a political cause. It's simply not true that Senator Chandler's bill or gender critical feminism more generally is trans exclusionary. Rather, it has a disagreement with gender identity activists over the classification of trans people for particular purposes. Gender identity activists want people classified by their identities. Gender critical feminists want people classified by their sex especially when it comes to things like sports and prisons, where bodies matter a lot. Gender-critical feminists include trans men and female non-binary people. Gender identity activists include anyone with a woman gender identity. No one on either side is excluding trans people per se. And the final point I want to make on inclusion is that women have been excluded historically from sports, from public life and from work. 
part of the project of working on women's full inclusion involves taking special steps to encourage more women into areas where they have historically been excluded. Including men in those projects might jeopardise them, especially where doing so increases injury risk or creates unfairness. So it is absolutely not the case that people who care about inclusion should want male trans athletes in women's sport and people who hate inclusion should want women's sport for women. Rather, people who care about inclusion should be thinking carefully about how women's inclusion in male-dominated areas of life might be negatively impacted by the push to include trans people in the opposite sex categories because of their gender identities. Inclusion rhetoric is propagandistic largely because it is so misleading. There are so many other interesting examples that I don't have time to go into here. Um, I've listed some of them here just for, for your reference. Um, maybe I just got, uh, say a tiny bit about the first one just for example. So there's the way that women fighting to maintain single sex spaces tends to be portrayed as segregation which means a dominant social group denying equal treatment or equal access to a marginalized group. And then this sets gender critical feminists up as the dominant or the oppressor. Whereas in reality, the fight for single sex spaces is separation, which means a marginalized social group withdrawing from the dominant group in order to create solidarity and support. And it's a feminist move. On that reading, it's males slash men who are the dominant or the oppressor on the grounds of sex caste and women who are the marginalized. So using the word segregation invokes a whole history of racial domination to position trans women in a particular way, whereas using the word separation tells more of the truth about why feminists care about single sex spaces. Okay, so although there's a lot more to say on this topic of gender identity propaganda, I'm hoping that what I've said already is enough, at least to make you think more about how gender identity activists are pursuing their goals, and in particular about the misinformation and emotional manipulation that's going on in the course of what is actually a pretty ordinary conflict of interests between political groups. <laughs>